From Polar Tech, the science of fabric. Creator of textile technologies and design solutions for any need and any reason, welcome to Layers, a deep dive into the untold or little known stories the outdoor industry is built upon. This is season one, the rise of dressing down. I'm Colin True. Well, I'm Greg McGillivray, and I've been making films all my life. I started out uh, when I was 14 making films about surfing and uh, graduated to uh, even better films on surfing when I was 14 and a half. Greg McGillivray is one of, if not the most renowned filmmaker when it comes to wielding an IMAX camera. Greg is the guy that Christopher Nolan called when he wanted to use IMAX cameras while making The Dark Knight. Within a half an hour, I can teach you all the things to do and not do, and then the things to be worried about. Um, Because there's a lot of interesting ways to use the big screen uh, in a really positive, powerful way. There's a better than good chance you've seen some of Greg's work at your local science museum or IMAX theater. His production company, McGillivray Freeman, is the first documentary film company to cross $1 billion in worldwide box office receipts. Their productions have gone from the depths of the ocean to the top of Mount Everest and into outer space, all while garnering multiple Oscar nominations. But Greg's first love was surfing. And it's also the first thing he committed to film. Yeah, I, I, my dad was a lifeguard in Corona Del Mar and we lived there in a small house. So I'd go to the beach all the time. And so I, I grew up hanging out at the beach, boogie boarding. And then when surfing came around uh, in the late 50s, My first board was a balsa wood board, and it was terrible. Oh my God. I mean, at $15, it was way overpriced. And then I started taking eight millimeter movies, and that kind of got me into filmmaking as a love, a passion. Surfing arrived on the west coast of the US from Hawaii pretty early in the 20th century. In the 1950s, with rock and roll as its soundtrack, Denim and t-shirts found each other, and film stars like James Dean and Marlon Brando, along with writers like Jack Kerouac, helped the youth of America find its voice for the first time. This new sense of generational expression would lead to a whole bunch of beach party surf films meant to capitalize on this movement. The most notable of which was Gidget in 1959. It started right around 59 with Gidget and then There are 40 of those terrible beach party movies in about three or four years. And they even danced on the beach. Of course, we never did. And you end up with these stupid shows that exploited surfing for a while. And then people stopped coming. Mm. And so it didn't have much of an impact. In fact, the, the film The Endless Summer was probably the first big introduction that America had to surfing. That was in 64 and then hit the big time in 66. Right. You know, it it changed the way people looked at surfing. And then by the time that we had our film, Five Summer Stories, uh, Jim Freeman and I, back in 1972, by the time that that came around, people were kind of adjusted to surfers and surfing. Distinct from the Hollywood version of surf culture, the authentic storytelling of the endless summer and Five Summer Stories pushed things to a whole new level. Both films took a sport that can only be described as beauty in motion, that is often done in places that are bucket list destinations, and put it on display to audiences which did nothing short of blow their minds. People literally lined up to see the endless summer in places like Wichita, Kansas, last I checked, not a well-known beach community, and Five Summer Stories created its own loyal following that resulted in a seven-year run at the cinema. Through surfing, surfers were able to escape from the pressures of a changing world into a more simplified, more pure environment. Usually when we'd get to a theater and it was showing five summer stories, there'd be a line drifting around the block waiting to get in. And so we would go down the line and ask everyone questions. We try to find out what radio station they listen to. But also we said, have you ever touched a surfboard in your life? By the 1976, half of the people in line had never touched a surfboard really goes back to what I said about how wonderful it is to watch surfers. Yeah. And my mother said that to me once. She said, you know, Greg, you're a good filmmaker, but she said, the fact that you made films about surfing gave you the break because 
you could do the worst job ever and it would still be interesting. <laughs> Last time on Layers, I learned that the rise of dressing down got started with a bunch of westward bound buckskin wearing posers. People who were inspired by nature and wanted to find a way to get outside. They tried to look like the more hardcore outdoor enthusiasts of the day and be part of a growing adventure seeking trend. These surf films are the first examples of media raising the profile of an outdoor sport to the point where it becomes a full on sensation. Surf culture and apparel would go on to infiltrate the youth of America in the 70s and 80s with brands like Ocean Pacific and TNC, and reach an authentic critical mass in the 90s with brands like Volcom, Quicksilver, and Billabong. The bottom line was simple. Surfing looked cool, and so looking like you surfed was cool. Just like their buckskin predecessors a century before, a trend was created based on the aspirational nature of an outdoor sport, and thus beach life and the vibe of surfing played an integral role in how we got more casual. And surfing wasn't the only thing with long-lasting cultural implications that come out of Hawaii at this time. What we today refer to as Casual Friday actually started in the early 60s as Aloha Friday to get folks in Hawaii to wear their floral shirts that had grown in popularity since the 1940s. That trend eventually migrated to the mainland and became the reason why you might get to wear pleated khakis with a polo to work each week. So it was actually more Toby Flunderson and less Magnum P.I. that led to your collection of Tommy Bahamas. It seems that no matter where we turn, we find ways that allow us to dress more casually. And in both of these cases, surfing and Aloha Friday, what started as a trend and attracted the uninitiated to participate, also created an industry. If only the makers of those buckskin suits had been able to make feature films of Daniel Boone or Calamity Jane running around the frontier. Think of how many more suits they would have sold. Surfing is the first modern layer of sport influencing how we dress, and today we are going to peel back three or four more layers revealing some key stories that complete our journey from stodgy suits and dresses to outdoor chic. We'll meet several people whose passion for their pursuits pushed the apparel making world into new solutions for performance that makes it easier to summit mountains or to run to your kid's school after yoga class. And we'll explore how technology made it all extreme extremely possible. Now buckle up, because when we get to the end of today's episode, we'll have gone from animal skins to four-way stretch. Welcome back to Lairs presented by Polar Tech. This is season one, episode two, Aloha Athleisure! In 1999, I was working at a mall-based outdoor retailer called Eastern Mountain Sports. It sounds crazy now to think about going to the mall to buy a kayak, but that was indeed how it was done back then, at least where I lived. There was a Sam Goody across from my shop, which meant that I had to endure the release of 98 Degrees Christmas album for like three months on my way to work. But it also meant that I got to celebrate Gary Sharon's departure from Van Halen with legions of long-haired concert shirt-wearing metalheads. All of the staff at our little gear shop lamented the fact that you could find some of the same jackets we sold at several of the anchor department stores located down the hall. The idea that you could buy a legit outdoor branded coat at a store like J.C. Penney's really pissed us off. What we didn't realize was that the way that everyone dressed was evolving right before our eyes. That a changing apparel and media landscape were conspiring to bring comfort and performance to the masses. Little did I know at the time, there had been forces at work for the previous hundred years that had brought us to this point. What we were all fired up about, according to our historian, Dr. Rachel Gross, was more of a preordained path that we had been walking for quite some time. The story of fashion in the 20th century is the move of sportswear from sports to everyday life. That's not specific to outdoor recreation, right? The outdoor industry is a part of that broader sportswear trend, right? And you can see it on a college campus in the 1920s when a Yaley, you know, is wearing a sweater embroidered with a Y on it and how that has an influence on fashions all over the country, right? Because of the proliferation of, of images, photographs from those campuses. Like Dr. Gross told us in episode one, Clothing choice is often about identity, and emulating authentic subcultures is how we seek to define ourselves. That subculture could be explorers of the frontier or Bay Area punk, or for the purposes of our discussion and to introduce our next guest, alpinists. The enthusiasm among the hardcore to go outside grew as we moved from the 1800s into the 20th century. Mountaineering came of age in the Alps and then extended into the rest of the world with alpinists determined to climb the world's highest peaks. As these adventurers gained notoriety with their feats, the pull of wild spaces, 
and the subsequent introduction of amazing new fabric and apparel technologies expanded to the point where it has affected how most of us dress on a daily basis. I wanted to talk to someone who was there and saw these gear and apparel advancements in real time. Maybe someone who takes aspiring outdoor folk up big mountains, but also has an intimate knowledge of outdoor apparel. So I called up Peter Whitaker. Do you have any memories from that time frame of being on the mountain, you know, using what was available at, at, at that time? I do, Colin. I mean, it goes back quite a few years, 40 plus. Um, I had a nickname uh, for quite some time when I was guiding uh, in my early years, and that was King Cotton. Peter Whitaker is outdoor royalty who belongs on our industry's Mount Rushmore alongside Ma Boyle, Jack O'Neill, and Vitali Romani. And I know the can of worms I just opened up with that statement, but I can defend each of those picks, and I would love to hear yours. For the record, I put Peter above his legendary Uncle Jim and above his own father and Jim's twin brother, Lou. Jim may be the first American to have summited Mount Everest and been the CEO of REI at one point, and Lou may have started RMI, arguably the most accomplished guide service of all time. But Peter's on-mountain resume holds its own in the world of mountaineering, and he has influenced the technical outdoor apparel industry as much as anyone. As you know, the downside to cotton is when you get in wet weather or freezing weather, it gets cold or whatever, um, it definitely doesn't perform. But I would say the one good thing about cotton, once it gets wet and freezes solid, it really keeps you warm. It's like cardboard. It's like a, a suit of armor that keeps your heat in and keeps everything else out. But it takes a long time to get it wet and frozen and, and is uncomfortable when you're doing that. For the longest time, alpinists, Arctic explorers, skiers, really anyone who consistently went out into cold climates had to play a fun game that I like to call Be Careful or You Might Die. The fabrics of the pre-industrial age could be managed to provide warmth, but you also had to make sure that they stayed dry. Go back and check out the team photo of George Mallory's ill-fated 1924 Everest expedition, and you'll see a bunch of dudes who look like they're dressed for dinner, not about to climb the world's highest mountain. When your job is taking people into dangerous places like the mountains, any advantage you can get to keep them and yourself safe is huge. And as outdoor brands have evolved over the years, it's been people like Peter who have guided them to make products that perform in all aspects. When you spend so much time up high and in the gear, you can't help but question some of the design, think about how to build a better piece. I can remember uh, climbing Rainier and there was like a foot of new snow, but it, it had rained on top, so there was an ice crust and there was a snap on my pant that was the perfect level. It was like 12 inches above the snow, but it lined up perfectly on the snap. And so every time I kicked a step, it drove the snap into my shin. <laughs> and so I did, this for like, I did this for like six hours. It's on the front and, of the pant? Wait, it was on the front of the pan. It was just what this the hell weird... is the snap doing on the front of your pan? Well, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were so many things that were just wrong. <laughs> and so, it's just like pounding yourself in the head with a hammer. And after oh, a while, God. you go, okay, something needs to be done you know, on that. And But I, but I worked with Marmot. I worked with Mountain Hardware. Uh, worked with Eddie Bauer and First Ascent, and most recently with Byte. And I think some of those early uh, design sessions with athletes, you would come in and you would explain a story like that to a designer. So not really a person that spent all that much time outside, but that designed clothing and understood how to do it. And we didn't know a lot. We just used the stuff, had some ideas. Right. And uh, I can remember a lot of those stories, <laughs> just blank faces, people looking at me going, oh yeah, that must have been really tough. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, do you have any <laughs> idea how much that hurt? <laughs> Just like, right. <laughs> Let me show um, you the permanent scar on my shin bone. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, Peter started his own brand, Bike Gear. The standard that every piece needs to pass to make it into the line? 100,000 vertical feet of testing by RMI guides. I'm guessing if you buy some pants made by Bite, your shins will be safe from misplaced snaps. The key takeaway here is that comfort is performance. Peter joked about his frozen suit of armor, but that was rooted in something that actually happened. If you were one of Peter's clients, would you want him to be worried about his apparel working properly? No way. You'd want him focused on getting you up and down the mountain safely. To that end, comfort may be the most important performance metric that we have. 
Seriously, go put on a rag wool sweater and hike around outside. Sure, it will breathe well and keep you warm when it's wet, but it will feel terrible and without a doubt adversely affect your good time out of doors. You'll be dying for a modern merino upgrade or a soft synthetic fleece. And then you had wool, which was like the anti-cotton. <laughs> it was, right. I mean, right. wool 20 or 30 years ago it was like putting on a steel wool blanket. You know, it had a lot of great qualities and could keep you safe, but it was not comfortable at all. You know, I do remember uh, some of the first fleece pieces and how amazing it was to feel something that was soft. And I, what we really used it for on expeditions was to roll it up and use it as a pillow. And once again, mountain climbing is long-term, low-level suffering. And at night, to be able to kind of have a pillow was a huge thing. Fleece was a game changer. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Colin True. You might remember me from such podcasts as Climb Mount You, What's in Your Mother's Closet, and this one. Today's episode is brought to you by Polar Tech Alpha. Looking for a date with recycled versatility? Then swipe right on the Goldilocks of regulated comfort. Not too hot, not too cold. Polar Tech Alpha is the original active insulation. And as always, just right. Oh yeah. And now, back to our show. This is as good a place as any to give our sponsor, PolarTech, what they wanted when I said to them, hey, let me make a podcast for you. So, let's talk fabric. I keep mentioning the new fabric technologies that came along in the 20th century and enabled our outdoor pursuits. There are plenty of names and fibers that you'll recognize here, from the DuPont creations in the 1930s of polyester, nylon, and neoprene, to the debut of Gore-Tex and even Thinsulate in the 1970s. But, and not to pump their tires too much, a lot of what we wear today in our outdoor and athletic-inspired clothing started at places like PolarTech. The window between 1991 and 1998 was particularly ripe with new fabrics that were invented to solve all kinds of needs. I was given the opportunity to speak with PolarTech's senior product manager, Karen Beatty. Karen was not only there in the 90s when these fabrics were created, but she's a longtime outdoor enthusiast based out of New Hampshire, where she spends her winters ripping turns at Magic Mountain and summers cruising brown pow at a Scutney Trails all while wearing the performance fabrics that she's had a hand in creating. People definitely layered, um, mm -hmm. but some of the parts in the layering system left a lot to be desired. And uh, when Malden Mills started looking at the, the problem to solve of, of getting a higher, higher insulating, higher performing, warm when wet, dried quickly type of fabric and started working with polyester and invented fleece, that ended up becoming, you know, an, an, an icon in dressing and layering and pretty much replaced a wool sweater for um, a significant amount of time uh, in mm -hmm. the outdoor layering system. That icon was called Polar Fleece. And after several years, it was perfected into what we today regard as synthetic or technical fleece. This was a time when these fabrics were solving real issues. I mean, Peter wasn't King Cotton because he wanted to be. At the time, he just lacked options. An industry that was in its infancy you start with a with a wonder fabric, polar fleece, solve some of the issues of, of what was currently in the layering system. You no know, wool sweater still was warm when it was wet, but it dried really, really quickly. Super comfortable, soft, really easy care. You can wash it, dry it. Pretty much became your best friend overnight, right? From there, it was game on in terms of finding new ways to address the needs of outdoor consumers. From 91 to 98, PolarTech released eight new fabric platforms, all geared toward outdoor and active apparel makers. From blocking wind, to warmth without weight, to the original soft shell, they were an absolute boon to outdoor brands and outdoor consumers. For long-suffering outdoorsy people, these innovations made everything easier and safer, allowing for versatility in the backcountry. But they were also comfortable as hell and worked in places that maybe weren't so dangerous. Here again is Ryan Thompson to explain. Kind of like I were talking before is initially a lot of these products were developed out of the need for survival, protection from the elements while you're out. Right. Well, what we're talking about now is obviously a modern, um, more comfort related story in terms of innovation. Elective danger. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I would say, yeah, it's tricky because each innovation kind of inspires spinoffs or maybe the um, mechanization behind one innovation might inspire a 
a secondary thing mm-hmm. in a knitting, a non-related um, textile field. But I think that as you realize that you don't just have to survive, you can be comfortable. Yeah. I think that also continues to spur innovation. How can we make it lighter? How can we make it more supple? How can we make it more quiet, as we know with laminated fabrics? The funny thing about all of this is that despite the obvious influence from the outdoor industry, most people will never know that it's because of folks like Karen, Ryan, or Peter that they have such incredible garments to wear. They'll never stop to think about what their stretch hoodie or tights are actually made out of, or how the brand they're wearing gained the ability to produce such a piece of clothing. The truth is that the poser is still driving the sale of most outdoor products. Today, the outdoor industry sports multiple billion dollar companies. That kind of revenue doesn't come about because of dirtbags who spend more time on the trail than they do in their own homes. A fair amount of revenue coming out of the outdoor industry is driven from lifestyle products. In a perfect world, those t-shirts and trucker caps are the gateway drug for posers who eventually find their way outside and, like me, become enthusiasts. True True believers. But most people would prefer to brave a chilly night in an authentic outdoor jacket rather than an unbranded blank from a rounder rack at a discount store. By the end of the 20th century, that was becoming more and more the case. It may have made us a little mad back at EMS in 1999 to see the same jackets we sold in a mall department store, but that's because we were used to seeing those jackets on Conrad Anchor. Everyone else? They were getting used to seeing those jackets on Method Man. As in the 1950s, youth was being courted by pop music and pop culture, and at the same time, Casual Friday was courting adults. The rise of dressing down had begun. Clothing, both outdoor and otherwise, wasn't the only thing changing or benefiting from new technologies or gaining new exposure. The ability to see and experience new things through TV or film became commonplace through the 60s and 70s. But it was in the 80s with the rapid growth of cable TV and home video that we saw the origin of selfie culture as athletes and tourists alike shouldered microwave-sized video cameras and started creating their own action videos. These easily shared and cheap VHS tapes quickly supplanted feature films as a way to show off what could be done outside. Instead of going to the theater to see surfers in a Greg McGillivray movie or skiers in a Warren Miller joint, your buddy would lend you their own video, and eventually you would find them at your local blockbuster. To get a deeper understanding, I needed to talk to someone who understands both the media and the outdoors. So I'm Steve Casimiro. I am the editor and founder of Adventure Journal. Most of my career has been in outdoor media, including Nat Geo Adventure, Powder, and Bike Magazines. There's no one working in outdoor media today with more trail cred than Steve. When we were setting up our interview, we had to account for the many backcountry trips he was planning. He's also been at this for a while and brings a perspective of how media advancements worked to bring outdoor sports to the masses as we got closer to the 1990s. And so I think there were a number of things that were happening in, in the late 80s. We, you had more affordable ways for people to make sports films. A lot of this came out of skiing and then came out of snowboarding. But in the early days, it was skiing was super cool. And there was the boom in VCRs and VHS. And so all of that kind of coalesced, I would say, around 88, 89, 90. Um, and then it got amplified. ESPN jumped on this. Snowboarding was obviously mm-hmm. going off um skate was getting more of its day um and then you have the rise of cable and espn those early days we didn't have the web we had the internet but you didn't have the web but then we got the web and you had the ability for media to be passed around much more quickly and much more affordably and and so i think that was you know where we saw this kind of like fractalized explosion hollywood also started getting in on the trend with the outdoors or outdoor adventures showing up in shows like grizzly adams hawaii 50 and baywatch and in feature films like cliffhanger and point break the outdoors even showed up in places like public broadcasting with shows like trailside featuring our very own peter whitaker hi i'm peter whitaker and I'll be joined by the only American to win an Olympic cross-country skiing medal as we hit the trails to the Grand Canyon and make our own adventure on Trailside. The reason I uh, connected with so many people was the adventures, anybody could do them. I mean, they were accessible and it wasn't extreme. And I think it really resonated with uh, a lot of people that were thinking about going outdoors and it maybe opened the door for them. Some good short shorts in that show, too, you know. (laughs) Shorter than shorts. (laughs) Short shorts aside, the accessibility of Trailside may have been one of its better qualities. 
But the extreme, the extreme movement of the 1990s is one of the defining turning points of how adventure sports would set in motion the wave that would eventually take us to athleisure. There was the rise of extreme, which at first was really cool and then was mocked. Um, but the first, I went to the first X Games, which were here in Southern California at Big Bear, and it was just totally this grassroots thing. But, you know, look at, look at what it's become. Like, it just mm -hmm. it blew up. While extreme, extreme may indeed be mocked upon reflection, it is a crucial point for the widespread adoption of outdoor apparel. Cable upstart ESPN went all in on this movement and started the X Games, which legitimized many of the sports a typical outdoor enthusiast enjoys today. MTV Sports becomes the network's number one show almost immediately after its launch, and blended music stars with unknown adrenaline-seeking athletes who were pioneering sports like skimboarding, mountain biking, skateboarding, land yachting, and inline skating. Mountain Dew becomes the first soft drink to link itself with action sports, which will eventually lead to where things sit today with Red Bull. With extreme, extreme sports, the outdoors continued its path of inspiring the youth of the day by leaning into the devil-may-care, it's-worth-the-risk style of these new outdoor activities. As a result, young posers such as myself were won over by the aesthetic. Hiking may have provided my entry into my new trail life, but I also loved watching aggressive inline skating comps at the X Games and felt like I was part of that tribe. And you could do most of these things wearing what you were every day. Skaters were in flannels and jeans. There were no team uniforms, no rules. Just get out and go. Eventually, with the addition of versatile fabrics and the influence of extreme, extreme sports, the mainstream started to catch on and participate. And it was primed because the outdoors had caught the eye of youth. In the 1980s, Patagonia Cinchilla, made with polar fleece, became a key chapter in the preppy handbook. While in the 90s, the North Face Denali, made with Polar Tech, became the de facto school uniform on college campuses. Perhaps the best moment to pinpoint the mainstream apex of these trends came in 1998, when Old Navy launched a line of fleece tops with an ad that featured recognizable faces from the previous 20 years of television and a catchy and campy jingle. Come on, everybody, sing it with me now. Old Navy, Old Navy, Old Navy performance fleece. Old Navy may have been an entry point for the mainstream, but it was the outdoor brands creating the demand for these crossover products. In the late 90s, new brands would identify a space between athletic performance and leisure casual, and would mark the future of how we would dress. Two of them are still going strong today, Athleta and Lululemon. Kelly Cooper was a VP of merchandising at Athleta when Lulu released their famous groove pant in 1998. It was a flare leg yoga pant, which, you know, honestly harder to do yoga in than a tight, but that was the original pant that had a flare leg. And women going to yoga and then realizing that they needed to pick up their kids or go to the, go run errands or go get coffee with their girlfriends, you know, that really started the whole movement towards, you know, street apparel coming from sport. You know, that was one of the other real um, watershed moments with Lulu and, you know, also Athleta. We both started in the late 90s, so had kind of parallel processing there for uh, a couple of years before, you know, Lulu really became known in the States. The development of a four-way stretch platform, Power Stretch Pro, in 1994 was crucial for these brands who were at the forefront of understanding how sport and lifestyle apparel was about to be blended together. Again, Karen Beatty from Polar Tech. In 94, I mean, were there other stretch garments? I mean, yeah, because I mean, obviously there's been things like bike shorts and things like that for years. Bike shorts, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, that, was, right? that, was, that was around then, yeah. Again, where it's like absolutes. How do you go after the absolute best solution to wanting a fabric that you can wear next to skin, which can manage moisture, stay warm, but stretch and move with you and allow perfect freedom of movement, never bag out, and, and be really, really durable. Um, so Power Stretch was like the kitchen sink fabric, right? We put all of our technologies out against it. And let's be honest, without the invention of Stretch, we wouldn't have jeggings. And that would be a real tragedy. <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Colin True. You might remember me from such podcasts as Pull My Finger, Superheroes Anonymous, and this one. Today's episode is brought to you by Polar Tech Power Stretch Pro. Have you lost your form? Do you need to recover your shape? It's time to go pro. 
Polartec's Power Stretch Pro is the original four-way stretch contouring fabric. Breathable, fast drying, and abrasion resistant, four out of five Arctic contortionists agree that it's time for you to move up to the big leagues with Power Stretch Pro. And now, back to our show. With products like Four-Way Stretch, brands like Lulu and Athleta would push the industry to new places in the new millennium. Bridging the gap between performance and lifestyle would elevate existing athletic-focused brands like Nike and spur the growth of grrr brands like Under Armour. Outdoor brands would all integrate products for more athletic categories like trail running and mountain biking, and fast fashion would lean into active wear hard. By 2016, the word athleisure was officially added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. You may find that word to be pretentious, but it's legit. And along with the Big Mac, jazz, and the sitcom, athleisure is one of America's most distinguished contributions to world culture. There's a great book on the dress casual trend of the 20th century by a historian named Deirdre Clementi. And she describes how sportswear is the story of American fashion throughout this century and how American sportswear spreads around the world, right? We're, we're really one of the most casual countries in many ways when it comes to integrating our athleisure, our yoga pants, and our hiking clothes into everyday life. And that's a much bigger trend of which this story in the outdoor industry is just one part. From buckskin to the beach, from the mountains to the quad, from extreme, the extreme. to athleisure, the rise of dressing down has arrived at this point where things work so well, we can wear what we want when we want to wear it. You know, when I first got into it, we didn't have that many fabrics. Now we have so many choices. It's just, it's just crazy. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So um, throw a stone, you're going to hit some amazing fabric. Like it's yeah. just, it's incredible how much is out there. And actually coming down to something that like you can legitimately wear every single day and it still looks good, whether it's a black merino tee or it's something like this hoodie. And even like now with work from home and we have this more democratization of uh, this flattening of the hierarchy in business. So, sure. you know, it's great to get dressed up, but like you can wear this stuff to work every day, which is pretty awesome. It's an awesome time to be getting dressed for either outdoor adventure or to brave the elements on the way to the coffee shop. Will innovation continue? Well, you bet it will. Especially as we find new and different ways to match the performance expectation we've established in a more sustainable way. We still have one more episode coming because while we've had a look at the nuts and bolts of why we dress the way we do, we still need to examine how the rise of dressing down has changed the way we go outside. A more inclusive community is growing as a result of the apparel revolution that we've been talking about. What was once simply outdoor? has now become a more welcoming outside. That's next time on Layers, presented by Polartec. We'll see you then. The extreme. This episode was produced at Digital One in Portland, Oregon, written by Colin True and David Karstad, produced by Colin True, directed by David Karstad, engineered by Eric Stolberg, and assisted by Tristan Schmunk. I'm your host, Colin True, Layers, presented by Polartec, is a production of Rock Fight, LLC.